resource manager. I would like to welcome all of you to the seminar. It is our privilege to have you with us today. We are now ready to begin the proceeding of the seminar. On behalf of Graduate School of Public Administration, NIDA, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking time of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, let me first introduce you to the agenda. We will set the ball rolling with associates, Professor Dr. Bun Anand Pinay Sap. Then we will have our guest speaker presenting her points of view on the seminar theme. We are fortunate to have one very prominent lecturer from Kromeng Kruma University. Is of I... science. Yeah, of science and technology. <laughs> yeah, Krom <laughs> Kromeng Kruma University of Science and Technology, Kruma, Kruma Sikana. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Around 6.20, we will have Q&A section, and so I will now invite Associate Professor Dr. Bun Anand Pinay Sap having a welcome speech. Okay, yes. Good evening, Dr. Juliana Abani. Students, I believe that uh, some of your students with us too, right? Okay, yes. And um, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to join a special program. The program invites Dr. Juliana Abani, who is our product and our alumni from PhD International Program. Right now, she is a faculty member in university in Ghana, which is her hometown. She is going to talk about how to conduct research and publish the articles in Scopus journals. I believe that she will tell us step by step techniques, how to do it and share her great experience with us. Again, uh, you will have uh, one hour for speak and then about 30 minutes for Q&A. So enjoy the uh, section and uh, I would like to say thank you so much Juliana and I would like to turn the stage to my MC. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you, you Professor. Thank you, thank you SSA you. Professor Dr. Bun Anand Pinay Sap. Next before the seminar start, I would like to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Juliana A. Abani is a lecturer in management study and public administration at the Department of History of uh, and Political Study, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, Ghana. Dr. Abane Ho, a PhD in Development Administration with a specialty in Development Management and Policy from our NIDA, Bangkok, Thailand, and MPhil in Public Administration from the University of Ghana. She has published in International Peer Review Index Journal, such as Public Organization Review, Future Business Journal, International Journal of Human Resource Study, Global Social Welfare, Global Encyclopedia of Public Administration, Public Policy and Governance, European Journal of Business and Management. So, we are extremely honored to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Juliana A. Abane, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know how do I do my sharing. OK, I can start sharing from here. OK. Am I there? Can you yes. see my? Yeah, you can yes. see. OK, so yes. um, it's here. Um, this is my very first time of using Microsoft Teams. So I'm not much familiar with it. In Ghana, we use Zoom quite a lot. It's similar it's, to Zoom. Oh, it's similar to Zoom. Okay. So I... Okay, so I'm putting... Wow. I, I have a very round... Um, 
a screen. Why is my screen round? <laughs> is that? We can see your screen. You can see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. Yes. Oh, OK, but why is my <laughs> screen is is round on my computer, though? I would have wished that I have a different uh, listen. But anyway, let's start. Um, today, our lecture is going to be on strategies for conducting and publishing articles, uh, research, and then conducting um, publishing in Scopus Journal. And I've divided the lecture into two so that we can have a very good understanding of these two areas. And so the first part I'll be talking about will be on the strategies on how to conduct your research. And I must say that in terms of research, the idea of our research is that we want to know or we want to discover why certain patterns exist in our world. And so when we pursue research, the idea is to discover some form of patterns that influence our worldview and our behavior. So that is how research is all about, to be able to, um, I, I, I think I have to come again. Uh -huh, I have gotten it. <laughs> so for uh, for today's lecture, we are going to have a brief of objectives of the lecture. And basically, I want you to understand or to develop skills for conducting both basic and applied researches, and also to understand the different methodological standpoints or viewpoints on how public administration research should be pursued and also to understand the basic process involved in publishing in highly indexed journals, especially Scopus. And by the end of this lecture, I expect you to be able to place your research project on the basic applied research continua, and also to look at the context within which you are writing and the purpose for which you are pursuing your research and also to understand each stage that you are going to complete, and especially also to look at the process that you are going to follow to arrive at the completed project. And so at the end of the day, we need you uh, for neither, uh, they insist you publish in the Scopus Journal before you can graduate. How do you jaspertize that? with your current research. Do you wait till you are done or how best can you do it? And so I'm going to take you through that at the end of the day. And I believe that when I'm done, you'll be able to perhaps go and apply certain few techniques to be able to complete your research project within time. So what is the nature, the outline for the first presentation? I'm going to look at the nature of public administration research. I'll be looking at the research process then turning your research ideas into projects, and then use of theory in research, paradigms and research approaches, and then the different models of PhD and the tax of authoring. And that is how we are going to do. So basically, when you look at public administration research, uh, we do it systematically. We expect that you collect data systematically. You are also expected to also interpret the data and you are also to make the clarity of the, uh, the research project. What are the aims and the objectives of that research? It needs to be what? Clear and everyone will be able to read and understand you. And in, in a way, if you look at public administration research, we are basically looking at how managers are able to perform the attacks every day and how best can we use this particular knowledge that they are using to perform the attacks to develop the, uh, the discipline of public administration. So in short, we need to do research, especially in public administration, because we have to revise the content or the subject matter of our discipline. And we can only do that through empirical investigation. And so public administration research actually have a 
a practical component where we take the, 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 the practice and develop it into theory to shape the discipline. And that's how public administration research looks at. Then we also have the types of research. Uh, I think you have done quite a lot in terms of the research approaches that we have, but there are two basic types of research. One is uh, the basic research and then the applied research. And if you look at the basic research, it is mostly uh, done by uh, students who are in universities and they want to uh, graduate and uh, achieve their uh, certificate. And so you'll be expected to go out there to collect certain types of data and then come and analyze. And Sorry, what Mr. Abane. Sorry. Yes. Uh, the slide is don't, don't move. We're still on the first slide. Yes. You are still on the first slide. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You, you, you can uh, show slide by place uh, below, bottom below. So yeah, it's moving yeah. now to the slide 10. Slide 10, yes. Yeah, I'm at Are slide 10. On? I'm okay, on slide now 10. now it's at 10. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. I didn't know. I didn't know that um, you, you were not. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, Professor. So let me uh, uh, change. Uh, can I change to the next slide and let's see? Has it changed? Yeah, it's slide? moving to the next slide. Okay, so I'm on slide uh, 11, uh, 10 now, which right. is types of research, yes. So I was trying to explain that uh, basically in, in our research world, you always have two continua, like you have the basic research and then the applied research. And for the basic research, it is mostly a requirement by most universities for students to bring the output as part of a requirement for a degree. And perhaps the content of that or the context of that type of research, you are looking at maybe um, the objectives that you have, you as a researcher want to pursue, and you also decide when you want to start the research. But with the applied research, you want to understand certain things more deeper. And so it's for people who are established in research or donor organizations who want to hire consultants to go and do a particular research project. But the idea of an applied research is to solve a problem unlike that of a basic research. So fundamentally, an applied research takes more time than a basic research. And so for basic research, the easiest is to do a cross-sectional survey. But for applied research, we are looking at um, a, a longitudinal research or multi-stage research where you go and collect the information. Then for some time, you analyze and go back till you, uh, you get to a point where the problem is being able to have other uh, solutions that you perceive are relevant to that problem. But with the basic research, you may have your recommendations section in your research, but it may not uh, be used by the study organization, unlike the applied research. But gradually, we are moving away from where students will just go and collect data, analyze and do recommendation without translating the recommendation to a manual or an actionable part of the research where the study organization can't use that information to restructure their organizational uh, uh, performance. That would be a very good step in terms of uh, the basic research. So in, in effect, a basic research can turn into an applied research depending on what the student wants to do with that information. Um, so for most textbooks, the research process are like stages. You move from one stage to the other until you complete your project. That is how most textbooks have actually def uh, defined the research process. You move from one stage to the other to get it. But sometimes these stages may vary. It depends on the university, for example, that you are 
what are the, 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 line, the guidelines for thesis writing and all that. That will also differ in terms of your research process. However, all research process, I mean, research processes have the same defining formula. So you need to have a topic in the first place, and that topic must be clear as a crystal a, a ball so that everyone will understand exactly what you are going to do. The next thing will be, okay, reviewing of the literature. You try to look at what is the existing knowledge saying about the topic that you have selected. Is there some controversy? Are there some clear uh, clarity that has brought on that topic already? Do you need to redefine your topic and before you can proceed? And that is why literature becomes very handy. And the next phase will be designing the research itself. That is the methodology section, then collecting data and then having your data analysis and writing up the report. So this is basically how the process looked like. But in reality, um, this particular type of uh, process I've described presents research as a rationalized process so that you move from one stage to the other till you end. But in actual practice, um, research process is not a straightforward one. Unlike what the books tell you, though, you move from one stage to the other. That is not what research process looks like. Sometimes you need to do some more than others. And the research process, I can tell you with my experience, little experience, is very messier. Sometimes you write your own ideas and you don't even understand what they are. For about one week, you have to put that work down and think about other things. That has, If you do your research and you haven't gotten to the confusion level of where to go, then of course you haven't started doing your research, especially at the PhD level. You should get confused. If you don't get confused, you won't get the clarity. So the messier it is, the better the outcome will be. And so that is how the research process looks like. It is not a straightforward one. It is little bit of corners. You have to care and care. Then you turn yourself round round and come back to the same uh, point where you started. And that will bring you more illumination. It will give you insight to be able to proceed with your work. Then it's... Even though it is messier, but we cannot take away the fact that the stages are important. So you need to also at least follow the stages, the stages at some point, and also to go back to them severally till you get the right information. So in reality, you may have to revisit each stage more than once. Sometimes you have to, the final product uh, you begin from the last and then you end at the first. And you can go back, back, back and forth, back and forth till the right uh, product is produced. So the stages are not to be, uh, be seen in isolation. You need to know that, okay, you may move from one stage and then you have to visit the third stage when you are in the last stage. It is normal. It's not that you haven't gotten it right. It is actually supposed to be so. And each time you visit the a stage, you need to reflect on the issues that are in that particular uh, phase and how will you redefine your ideas to help shape the work. And that is very key as a student. And so you need to also have uh, some form of Ethics, especially if you are writing, there are sometimes uh, we we you 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 are going to study a group of people, and there are certain clearance you have to consider. So when you pick a topic and there's issues of ethics, how are you going to resolve them? You need to think about it, and why you are writing that particular phase. And for a good topic or a good research topic, you look at the feasibility. Can I do it? You know, there are some topics that are not researchable. It is not your duty to uh, uh, research that topic. So even no matter how dear it is for you, the point is that it may not be able to uh, to be studied. And that should be very clear. And some students don't understand this. 
Once you tell them that this topic cannot be studied, kindly go and read and reframe it and then um, narrow it down. Then it becomes a problem. Then you should know that as a, a student researcher or even researchers know that not all topics can be researched because the actual execution of the research, may, research topic may be difficult to undertake. Then the next thing is, is it appropriate? Is it worthwhile my time? After I have studied all this, will it be anything useful to society or even to me in general? So these are some of the questions that you need to ask yourself when you are looking at a topic. And the ideas are usually different from a research project. So you may want, you may have it, an idea, but is the idea good enough to turn into a research project? So for example, a research idea on advertising and share prices. If you want to do a research on this particular one, you need to go further and think about the possible questions that you can raise out of it. So for example, how does the running of a TV advertising campaign designed to boost the image of a company affect a share price? With this particular one, you can actually go further and study it and look at the relationship between TV advertising and share price. That can be a very good topic for you to move. But if you just look at um, advertising and share prices, it is not a topic yet. So after you have generated it into a question, then it will give you the relationship. Once the relationship emerges, then it becomes more clearer for you to proceed with your topic. It is the same way if you are looking at internet recruitment or job recruitment. You can further look at how effective you want to look at comparative. So it will be better for you to look at it in terms of comparative analysis with a traditional uh, a way of recruitment and then just for ties that with the internet based recruitment. That could also lead you to have a better research project. So in fact, you can uh, have an idea, but ask yourself whether this idea is it, can it be turned into a research project? If the answer is yet, raise the next question. Raise what questions that are bothering you about that particular idea, and then you begin to what, turn it into a research project. And when you are doing the research project, the first thing you need to do is to write your objectives. Because the objectives are normally to help you focus on the actual deliverable, the, the things that you want to know or the solutions that you are looking for. So when you write down your research objectives, it will shape that uh, uh, thinking or it will narrow down your topic to the deliverables that you are going to get at the end of the day. And as a result of the objectives, the carving of your research questions become more what? easy. However, there's a contention between whether to maintain both research questions and objectives at the same time. This is just a matter of um, preference. Some people or some universities will prefer you have the two. You have both research objectives and you have research questions. It is the same thing. However, remember that objectives are very more uh, relevant in your data analysis. We want to see whether you said, okay, I wanted to achieve A, B, C, D. Have I been able to do that? So the objectives become the focus point in terms of your discussion of your findings and also in the summary section of your thesis. And that becomes very, uh, where the objectives play a very upper role than the questions. So, um, after your, this, these are objectives that you can easily raise about a topic that you are looking at. And so I've just placed them there and you ask yourself whether, uh, why um, maybe the topic you are interested in is in team briefing. And so you can, the research question can be in this form and then to identify organizations objectives for team briefing schemes. Why have organizations introduced team briefing? So it's just a matter of changing the question to a statement that becomes an objective. And for you to do a research project, you need to think about theory. 
Now, theory uh, in research has been one of the debates that uh, we have, even after my PhD program, I haven't been able to resolve the issues because um, some people believe that theory precedes what precedes data, meaning that uh, before uh, you go and collect your data, you must have a theory, ground your work in a theory before going to the field to collect the data. Some people also believe that uh, data precedes what theory. It means that you have to collect the data and then analyze the data and see which theory it coincides with. And then based on that, you say that this is the theory that this work is able to what, um, link with. But it is a question of methodology, the methodological viewpoint, two extreme positions. One sees the world from one single perspective. Another one sees the world from a multiple perspective. And so because of that, uh, they believe that you have to move from one point to another. But for those of us who are contemporaries, we don't want to hold on to these debates. We want to look at what is feasible. So when you are looking at a research and you want to use a theory, ask yourself, is it feasible for me to use a theory at this point? If it is feasible, then you go ahead with it. But if you, you are not able to figure it out that the theory will fit into the write-up currently, then it is good to go into the field, collect the data, and then come and see the underlying patterns of your data and organize them according to a theory. That is what we call a grounded theory. But for those of us who also believe in doing quantitative research, you want to set hypotheses. And so certain hypotheses automatically you are going to test a theory. And that's where you will need to have a theory before you move to the field. However, once you take a theory, it will help you to shape your objectives. What is a theory? A theory is just a, a guideline or something that tells you the relationship between the cause and the effect. Okay, it tells you the relationship between the cause and effect relationship. So between one variable or two or more variables. So at the end of the day, if you want to test or verify a theory, then of course you have to have a theory before you proceed to the field. And quantitative research are mostly uh, need, uh, need theory to be able to formulate their research objectives and questions before they go to the field. And so, and I will always say that um, theory helps you to understand the objectives of your study. And I use one example of a theory like the universal uh, technology acceptance, acceptance theory by David in 1989. He came out with a theory that says that the extent to which people in an organization can accept a particular form of technology are influenced by three fa uh, four factors. The first he calls performance expectation, efforts, uh, expect, uh, expectancy, and then ease of use and also uh, behavioral intention to use. So he says that, well, for you to be able to say that, okay, I have introduced a new technology in this organization. Then, of course, these four variables must be present before it can be accepted. And so when you take such a theory, your objectives must be carved around these four uh, uh, variables in that theory. So actually, theory helps you to be able to understand the scope of your work. And once you pursue the uh, quantitative field, then, of course, theory becomes very central. And you look at the work of Sapton and Stoll, 1995, uh, within 1989, they all agree that um, as a researcher, you must ensure that what is passing as good theory includes whether it's plausible, whether you can use it. Is, it co is there coherence explanation for why the relationship exists between the two or more variable? And what are you expecting in your data? So sometimes you may use a theory and you go out there and that theory does not support your data. What do you do? So you must always remember that your theory that you have started with is supposed to support your data. 
When you come and it doesn't support, quantitative will not give you the privilege of what? Changing a theory that will suit your what data. That's one thing you have to get clear. However, if you are doing a qualitative, then of course you can change. But with quantitative, what you need to do is to explain why your data do not fit with the theory. Why is that so? Are there, what are the, the, the probabilities? What are the, the regularities within your data that made it uh, different from what the existing theory have already mentioned? And so the use of theory in your research is to perhaps think about the world uh, in a way to bring about changes and also to think about the world, how certain things or terms can be applied generally. So if you look at substantive theories, and grounded theories, they are all trying to explain the world from a general perspective and how these theories can be um, applied in different contexts and environment. But we do have the middle range theory. There are some theories that are not full, fully blown theories. We call them models. And so there are models that are derived from substantive theories that can also be used to uh, study whatever topic you are interested in. So um, in terms of your literature review, this is a very crucial moment. If you are a student, you want to write your study, uh, do your research, the best is to start with literature review. I remember when I was doing my PhD, the first thing I started to do was to write my literature review. I wanted to know the major issues of uh, knowledge surrounding the topic that I was doing and also to look at them in terms of the critical aspect of it. So I look at general, I do general uh, review, then I come in with a critical review. So with, with a preliminary search, it helps you to generate your research ideas and the next phase or second phase of your review will be to analyze that body of knowledge, try to critique it and, and be able to establish the gap. It is only that you'll be able to proceed further with your research. So sometimes it is good that you have a very fair knowledge about what you are writing. But one thing you know we should know is that we don't live in an island. Whatever you are coming to write about has already been in existence. So you are not going to reinvent the wheel and others have already done it. So because of that, you need to demonstrate your scholarship of the current state of knowledge in the subject that you are interested in to jaspertize that with why your study is important at this point. And that makes you a what? A scholar. So literature actually shows our scholarly levels and some papers or journals will not accept a paper that do not have a very extensive review of the literature. And that is why you need to consider literature review in your research project as very essential. And for uh, Janko's week 2005, he believes that there is no point in reinventing the wheel. The work that you do is not done in a vacuum but builds on the ideas of other people who have studied the field before you. And this requires you to describe what has been published to marshal the information in a relevant and critical way. And that's why literature review is important. And I've provided these checklist boxes for you to look at how to go about doing a critical review of your literature. And you have them. So first you do the annotated uh, reading. After you, you need to indicate, highlight where you want to come back to, and then you look at evaluating the content of the literature. Try to ask more questions about their suitability to the topic area. Then evaluate whether your literature review is critical. Have you been critical of the content that you have just read or written down? Then you do that. But there are three sources of literature that you can always have. We have the primary sources and then secondary sources, and we have the what the tertiary. But 
in all literature review, especially that is towards a thesis project, the best is to look at what? Journal articles. Journal articles, or sometimes you can look at conference proceedings. These are areas that you can have good information that will help you to write your thesis. So I'm going straight to the paradigms and research approach, approaches. Uh, in public administration, we currently have about four paradigms or perspectives. The first one is either positivism or post-positivism. Then we have the constructivism, and then we have advocacy or participatory. Then the last one is the pragmatism. And these four um, perspectives or paradigms all have what they actually look for when we are pursuing a research. And for post-positivism, we are looking at determination. We want to find out what exactly will be the end result if we add A plus B, or if we say that there is a, a significant and a positive relationship between uh, job performance and uh, training? How would that come out? We are also looking at trying to look for measures or to reduce, do what we call the factor analysis. If you have several factors, we want to reduce them to explain the concept in much uh, brief or a sense. We want to reduce them and then uh, study to make better meaning out of them. Then we also pursue empirical observation. You go to the field and collect the data and come back and make sense of them. And you do measurement. You have you, you need to <coughs> sorry. You need to have items that you can use to measure them. The questions that you use to measure these uh, empirical observation. Then theory, you want to verify theory. So because of that, the, the hypothesis must be verified. For constructivism, it's all about understanding. It's all about trying to bring multiple meanings that the different uh, participants who will be part of your data, uh, data collection stage will understand the topic that you are studying. Then sometimes you need to look at the social and historical construction. There are certain type of data that we cannot have uh, used the normal empirical survey to do it, but we may have to go back into documentary uh, analysis to be able to understand the social patterns that existed and then compare it with the present. And here, the purpose is to generate a theory. And so when you finish, that is where a, a grounded theory can emerge out of that. Now we are looking at participatory or advocacy because we are looking at how minority groups uh, are being my, uh, undermined, how policy effects uh, are happening and how best we can resolve them. So because of that, the advocacy and the participatory type of uh, perspective is emerging. We want to empower people to be able to take over their lives. And we also want to have a collaborative networks and pro proceed uh, with change dynamics. We want the world to be a better place. If you look at the climate change, for example, uh, the world is advocating for uh, countries to rally around to reduce the effects of global warming and others. These are the advocacy that we are talking about when it comes to the perspectives in public uh, uh, administration. Then pragmatism will also look at problems. They're looking, they're looking at problems that they can resolve. They are also trying to look at their real world experience and how best they can reconstruct that into certain form of a, a system so that we'll be able to understand. But the point is that if you look at these paradigms, the, it tells you which type of research approach should you take. So we have two major approaches. But how, however, out of these two uh, major approaches, we will have a third one. And the third one takes a little bit of each of the two approaches. So we have the quantitative and the qualitative. And if you decide to do both quantitative and qualitative, then we call it the mixed method approach. So a quantitative is positivism, qualitative is interpretism or constructionism. Depending on why you want to pursue your research, it will determine which type of method. So your research objectives then again will inform you what type of research approach to take. 
either will it be qualitative, will it be quantitative, or it will be mixed method. But I can tell you that sometimes the way we mix method are totally different. Sometimes you don't need to mix the method. It is your research questions or objectives that will determine whether there's the need for a research, a, a mixed method study. So I, I tell my student that you cannot do mixed method because your objectives are not indicating mixed method, but you want to do mixed method. And mix, the, the idea of mixed method is not just to, to duplicate another research methodology. No, it is to answer something that may not be a one particular method may not be enough to do that. So when you understand this, you will know that if the, the two traditions will always stand in us uh, separate, but if there's the need where the two cannot answer and you have to draw the two together, then that is why you have to use mixed method. So these are quantitative, we analyze numbers. Uh, you place reliability, validity, generability. So you want to be able to generalize it to the a sample population. You want other people to be able to replicate your study. And so uh, your research report is supposed to be a structured one where you move from uh, theory to data. Okay. With a qualitative one, it's, it's more complex. It tries to look at issues or areas that are unexplored things that we don't know the questions yet, then of course you can use that one. And mostly we use the open-ended type of uh, issues to look at it. And you sometimes, where's are what you are trying to discover or what we call the thematic and narrative data analysis. And you are trying to uh, look at how individuals interpret their world or a particular phenomenon or occurrence. And you yourself as a researcher, you place yourself in that particular uh, context and see how best you can write it better or to understand the topic better. So you wear the shoes of your participants. So you take an active role in interpreting whatever data that you have collected from the field. Now mixed method tradition, of course, I said uses both qualitative and uh, quantitative. The, the point is the integration of these two data sources will help you to have an embedded nature of research. Try to merge your findings, try to look at what was different when you use the two together and what are the other uh, phase saying or the, if it was a single one, how would it have been? So that's how a uh, mixed method is. But I want to say that in terms of the mixed method research, there are different uh, portion, uh, different types. We have the quantitative plus the qualp. I you look at this table down here. I put in a day, a uh, qualp plus quant, and then quant plus qualp, and quant equals to qualp. Now I want to take the last one. If we say that quantitative is equals to qualitative. It means you start with quantitative and end up with what? Qualitative. So first you design a, a standard questionnaire, go and collect the data, do your preliminary analysis. Then you, you change the quantitative data into qualitative interviews and go back and collect data. That's why we call it quant equal to qual. Then quantitative plus qualitative, where the capital letters are. It means that they are going to form the basis, they, they are going to have the equal uh, weight. So 50 50. So 50% of your work will be quantitative, 50 will be what? Qualitative. Then quantitative plus a qualitative plus quant. So 60% or 70% of qualitative and maybe 30% of quantitative. Then quant plus qual is the same thing 60 or 70% of quantitative a little bit part of what qualitative but the point is that students we are not able to understand how to mix these uh, approaches or how to do the the integration and that is quite a, a little bit uh, problematic so when you are doing your research ask yourself what percentage of the work is quantitative and what percentage is qualitative then you can understand what type of uh, methodology you are using so we have two uh, traditional models in PhD. 
we have the classical model and then we have the thought model. And if you look at the classical model, it's basically from the British uh, point. It's being influenced by Britain and the European countries. They, their universities are those running this classical model. And what they expect you to do in terms of the thesis requirement is to write a big book, a, test, a, a chapter book, probably from 80,000 to 100,000 words long as a book, a book project. And your supervisor, you may have either one or two supervisors with a, a thesis committee at the same time. But with a top PhD model, where uh, that is what NIDA does, uh, you have about the first stage, they are, equal, they are into two process. They admit you as a PhD student. Then after the studentship, the two years coursework, then you move to what candidacy. And that is where the dissertation stage falls in. And you have the main advisor plus minor and then the rest of the dissertation committee. And with this type of uh, PhD model, you are expected to have, sometimes they can, you can publish about five to four articles, quality papers in very high index journal or Scopus journal, and that will constitute your PhD dissertation. Or um, you can even write the book, uh, the thesis output, but you must publish some papers out of it. And that is what the American model uses and then part of Asia. And then currently um, Ghana is trying to merge both Britain and then UK model. And they've introduced the uh, coursework component, one year coursework component, and then they still have the, the book as a thesis as, uh, at the end of the day. But there are two outputs for uh, three outputs from a PhD. We have the focus down model, the opening model, and the compromise model. Mostly when you are writing your PhD, uh, the focus model, you look at large literature review, and then from the large literature review, you have a similar close to the literature review, your meta section, your materials that you'll be using to collect the data. Then you move to the core. So you try to look at uh, the data analysis and also the ending part of your research. And that part is very small. And this is mostly in the social sciences. We, we, we dwell so much on the literature or secondary data before we arrive at our analysis. Then we have the opening out model. That one is within the sciences, the fiscal sciences, where you have a brief literature review, then the setup, which is the method, the, uh, the data collection period is quite huge. Then you have a very little uh, analysis stage, and then you have the discussion end. And that is what we call the opening model. Then the compromise model try to look at, to balance the three areas, to have a little bit more of literature. Then you have the core being the very large part, and then you have a little bit of analysis and a little bit of discussion, and then you end your PhD dissertation. So basically, if you take your PhD project, ask yourself which of the models am I going to write about, or which one is the acceptable model within my university. Once you get to know that, then of course you'll be able to start your research project. And one key thing I, have, I want to end with this is to look at effective referencing. Because you cannot write professionally without keeping track of your sources. So make sure that you make references to every information that you are going to have. Because at the end of, if you have to wait till the end of your writing to be able to track your references, then of course it will be a problem. Now we have, uh, you cannot pass in anything as a, a, a even a, a research paper, neither can you pass anything as your PAD thesis. I remember my PAD thesis, the final score, I had 5%. And the total number of pages for my PhD was 350. So you, you, you need to make sure that you write very well. At the same time, you have what? References. And my references span from about 20 pages. And that should tell you that you need to have time. You need to make sure that you keep track of every little information that you pick from any source. You cannot pick people's work without crediting them. The moment some countries 
plagiarism or some universities, when they get to know that your work was plagiarized, then of course they can uh, revoke your degree. So whether you are quoting verbatim or paraphrasing, you must always what, cite your sources. However, we know that if it is a, an open knowledge or common knowledge, common knowledge is something that everyone that is in, in, in open literature or popular literature, with such information, you may not be able to, I mean, you don't need to uh, do the, uh, to, to credit such sources or cite such sources, but you must also cite in terms of, if you took it from another person's work, then you have to credit that person, that taken from this person. So in fact, um, I have finished with my first one, and I want to thank you very much. Is it Kunka Kunka? Professor. Hello. Yes, please. So do I do I do you want me to give you five minutes uh, of break? I want you to we can use five minutes and then I come in with the last one, or I should continue. Which one? Okay, so okay, um, so. you can um, if you don't mind, should you continue? Yes, I can continue. Yeah. So I'm going to share my next uh, slide. Um, uh, Doctor Abiana. Yes. I one question. My you name can. is Anok Wan. I am student under Dr. Abu Nanan. Thank you for today's oh. informative explanation. Very great. And we are same at NIDA. Really appreciate. So um, let me ask one question. Will you share us the slide presentation? Yes, Do I will. Do you like to share us? Yeah, I will share with you. Thank yeah, you very much. Very you well. are our senior as a university. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I'm coming to do the next presentation uh, on. Uh, have we, ha, is it changing? Can you see? Yes, yes, okay. yes. So my outline is changing. OK, my it's second. Changing. Thank you, Professor. My second outline is to look at uh, writing a scientific paper. So let's assume that you have completed the, the, the full dissertation. Now you are looking at how, how am I going to reduce this work, this bulky work into a, a, a paper and then get published. And then we look at the steps that you need to follow in publishing Scopus journals. And then I'll have my concluding remarks. So first of all, I want to say that there's no straightforward to publish any a piece of work that you have. You, 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 you need to know that, that there's not a straightforward way to do this. Sometimes um, our expectations are that we want to publish in very high rank uh, index journals in, in Scopus. You send your paper there the first time, they, they will even send it out and then they'll throw it back to you. So sometimes publishing is not uh, I say that it is easy for a woman to get pregnant and give birth than you publishing one paper in a year. So it is not that easy to just go out there and do a publication. And so um, I also want to say that Scopus is one, is an indexing platform for the social sciences and they keep electronic versions of journals. And we have the web of science and others for the science uh, related disciplines. So it is important that we know that there are several other indexing platforms that are equally good, but it depends on the requirement for your university. However, Scopus is popular because uh, it's a, it is prestigious and you may want to have your paper published in a Scopus index journal because the, the kind of a quality that it brings in terms of peer review is what makes it very important to have your paper published there. So what are the standards of writing a scientific paper? First, I want to say that um, for any research project, you need to contribute to what? Uh, to science. And if you don't contribute to science, it means that 
that information you went and collected is so it's not useful and you have to write it in the standard format to be able to get a, your work complete but there are certain formats that you have to use in terms of turning your research paper into a scientific word work so how do we write or uh, as scientists how are we going to be able to write a good scientific paper and i say that for you to write a good scientific paper it takes time you need to have time for your your work you may have i there are certain papers since i completed four years ago that i'm still writing on and they are they are they are manuscripts some have gone out for review and they have come back and i'm still working on them to improve them so it actually takes time for you to be able to uh, get your work published so it is for example if you are in your second if you, you your first year in pad program i would advise you to start right to start if you have started your literature review then of course you can start using your your conceptual literature as a paper and that can be a starting point to be able to meet the deadline in terms of publication before you complete and the writing a paper is so much stressful to the extent that sometimes you ask yourself what is the effective way to write a paper how how should i go about writing my paper and i say that i feel that before uh, you think about writing the paper, think about writing your paper from the inside out perspective. So you begin with the important areas like the method and materials. So that's what I call the inside out. So you begin your research uh, paper from your method section because all journals or Scopus journal focus more on the materials and method section. If you're, you don't describe your work very well, your paper will be rejected. So that is the portion that you have to start writing about. Then if you finish writing the, met, uh, the material section, the next is to look at the results section, try to draft the results. So you see that we are not even looking at literature review for now. So we are starting from methodology section to make sure that we write it very well because it's going to be the heartbeat of your research paper. And if you fail to make it right, then the entire work will not be very meaningful to reviewers. So make sure you start from the method and material section, move to your results. Once you know the procedures and the steps that you need to take to conduct the study, then of course the results become handy. Remember this result has already been there. So you would have had the results already but it's the formatting of this result that is um, that, that that is what I'm talking about. So you need to write the result section after the method section. Then the next thing is to outline the discussion. So you move from where a uh, result to your discussion uh, phase, and then you write a working conclusion. The next thing I think you have to do in terms of a scientific paper is to go back and write your introduction. In writing your introduction, you have to write your what? Your, your literature review. And the literature review should be quite a summary of maybe the detailed work in your PAD dissertation or any research that you are having. So you are going to do what we call reduction. You have to reduce the content. You compress it, but make sure the relevant portions of the literature stand out. The introduction will be where the problem have to be stated. Why are you writing at this point? Why is your work relevant? Is it that your work, is it something novel or there is some extension of work that you are going to do? Is it somebody theoretical uh, uh, model that you are testing? You need to make that clear. So after you have done all this, written your, 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 your meta section, your results, your discussion, your conclusion, then you come back to the introduction. There's a need for you to now, after you've tidied up these areas, then of course you can think about the title and the abstract. So you don't go straight away and start putting the title down. You may not even get to understand what you are writing about. But if you put 
the body together before the, the last part, then of course it will come clear what will be the title and how the abstract should be followed. And if you, I know neither uh, student, we have read the bill to last. If you re read the bill to last, you realize they wrote the paper, they wrote their research, completed it into a book, and the last minute they got the title of the, paper, uh, the, the book. And it has become one of the best sellers in the world. And that is how a, a good work or a written work is supposed to look like. The title shouldn't be something you are looking for. Write the body first, and then before you come to the uh, main preliminary aspect of the paper. And so throughout your writing, you know, the technique should be the same. Use precise words. If you are using numbers, sometimes numbers uh, or tables makes the work much easier. But some journals who are qualitative in nature, if you use more words, uh, more uh, numbers without uh, play English explanation, you send it, they will bring you back and say that you haven't been able to explain enough. But if it is some quantitative journals, then of course they wouldn't have any problem with you using precise words and numbers. But some papers will still, in, or qualitative uh, journals will still insist that you explain more in plain English for them, uh, the, the, the numbers to make them clear. So you should write direct sentences. Let your sentences follow from one point to the other. And that is how uh, you write a scientific paper. And remember the writing of a scientific, a scientific paper is quite irritative. You do it over and over. You do it, reassess and do it. You take time to come out with a complete project. So the point is, at every level or every point of your writing, you, re you need a reassessment. You write and cancel, you write and cancel. It's normal. Everybody goes through that process all the time. And your manuscript, for example, should be a blueprint for your survey. Sometimes if you start writing this particular manuscript, it will help you to figure out how the survey was actually conducted. And a scientific paper will help you to have your research questions. It will help you to have your data analysis in an orderly fashion and all that. So at the end of the day, you have a piece of work that looks like this. You have the abstract, the title is there, introduction, and some journals will have introduction, including the literature, okay? Introduction includes the literature. Then you have materials and methods, you have results, discussion, conclusion, and then references. So this is how the prototype format in most journals uh, that they use. But some journals will want you to break the introduction into two, uh, introduction and then literature review. So it depends on the journal format. And what do you do with this um, prototype? The first thing I want you to look at is precise language. Make sure that the language of your scientific paper is very clean and avoid being emotional about your work. Don't use certain words that evoke emotions. It's, it's supposed to be a scientific paper and not an emotional paper. So you may want to uh, avoid that. Then you have to, uh, you need a single clear direction. You move from one uh, uh, point to the another. So if you are starting from methods and material, so method and material, next is result, discussion, and all that, then till you arrive at what? The conclusion. Then you can go back to the introduction phase and then you write also. Then the, the fourth thing is review and made available to others. Try to give your work to your colleagues or your senior colleagues to read through for you because you have been with your work. If you don't give it to another person to read, the person, I mean, you send it out and mistakes that could have been avoided will be there. So always give it to your peers to review the, your writing before you send it out. So what are the steps in publishing in Scopus Journal? Um, the decision to uh, publish in the Scopus Journal should be made considering the following. Your, the length of your paper. You see, you you some of us are not able to 
write a summary. So because of that, uh, the ways the length of the paper is usually a problem. So if you send them a, a lengthy paper, they will send it back to you. The editor, uh, the next. Sorry, Dr. Abane? Yes. Okay. I've just seen that okay. my, you come back again. my internet, okay. yeah, my internet went off, but it has come back. Can you, hello, can, it's my, yeah, yes, it's my, you. You, you, you are, yeah, so length of paper, your words, words must be very precise, concise, and about 80,000 to 10,000, some even require less than 8,000 words, so, and for research methods, papers, they may want you to go beyond 8,000 to 10,000. And conceptual papers are less. But I tell you, make sure your paper doesn't exceed about seven to 8,000. The way uh, the paper length should be very short but clear. The second guideline is that go to the website, the journal website, and look at the guidelines for that journal because they have a layout of the structure. So the one I gave where you have abstract um, uh, methods and results and others may not be the type of uh, structure that that particular journal you are interested in will, will have. So you need to look at their content and lay out your work very well. Even the referencing style is usually different. So the guidelines is where you have to read to make sure that you format your paper to the structure that the journal is requiring. Then you look for a sample paper, download one sample paper from that journal. You know, you cannot write without having a frame and the sample paper will help you to figure out how even you can even read through and see how the person linked one paragraph to the other. What are the important key? How many paragraphs do I need to put in the introduction? That can, a sample paper can help you to figure out that. But the idea is that you should avoid what? Copying that particular style. If you copy that particular style, it is likely to uh, lead to the rejection of your paper. But you just want to know how the structure of the paper or the, the, that particular journal publishes. And that is why you need a sample paper. The fourth one is fitness. Choose your research methods, theories based on the best fit of the journal. Is the journal, if the journal is your journal of choice, of course, you have to ask yourself what are the, the, the rudiment or the content of my work? Does it fit with that of the papers that have been published or the, the aims and scope of that journal? That is what you need to know. So that you don't write and send your paper to a, a journal that do not fit your work. So always make sure that your work suits the paper that you are selecting. Then have a clear explanation of your methodology section. Because the method section is the most important part of any, any research. It makes your work believable. If you fail to make your methodology clear, nobody will believe that you actually went and studied what you are describing. So make sure that all the procedures that you followed, you should be able to explain for maybe perhaps a three year old child who can read and, uh, and understand, can take your paper and read and know that you follow one B, C, D to be able to arrive at what you said you did. Because once your, your research is not believable, no good journal like a Scopus journal will publish anything. So that should be very clear. The C point is that keep it clear, but short. Don't know unnecessary details, cut out certain things. Where is that mean double? Like you have somebody write, okay, a value or a maybe uh, another one, value neutrality or value free, you stick to one word. Make sure that the words that you are, you, because there's no space. Remember, you have only 80,000 words to produce. So repetitive or trying to write in a different sense 
when you can go straight to the point and make your work more uh, uh, clean, it should be better. And don't bring too much large methodology. Try to avoid it. Your methodology should be precise and concise and clear. However, avoid lengthy um, People are waiting in the, in the lobby. Hello. <laughs> OK. Oh, I can people, hear you. Yeah, Let's people are waiting. I had a notification that people are waiting at the lobby. OK, yes, I will tell my staff to let them in. OK. I, OK. I accept him in, in the room already. Okay. OK, so the next thing is to have justification. Just provide a reader with exactly what your research is and how did you come about what you are just, I mean, you just provided and try to justify the techniques that you have used. If you decide to use a convenient sample method, tell why you think you, a convenient sample was the best for you to use. So justification becomes very central in your work. used nobody will, 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 will take your paper serious so justification in, in research papers that are published in, in scopus is very key so you need to make sure that at every point anything that you use try to justify why you decided to do it the way you have done it then presentation of the result the result should be presented in a way that makes things very clear because your data and resource section becomes the heartbeat of your work. So if you present it in, in a way that nobody understands you, if you don't present it in a clear language, it's going to affect the evidence that you are bringing to that field of study. So make sure that um, your resource section are presented in a way that, pre that, that places your work within the context of the broader literature and also to make sure that your audience understand what you are presenting. It's very important to do so. Then the sentence structure and tense. Sometimes you as a researcher, you owe the, 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 the style of your, 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 your writing. The tenses that you use is from you. So you may want to ask yourself, am I using the right tense in this particular section? And there's a lot of disagreement over what uh, language should you use or tenses should you use in the various sections. But the best thing I can tell you is that always refer to the APA manual. They, they have a style there. So for the APA manual, the literature review is always in the present tense. And then the method section is in the what? The past tense. Now the result section can either be past or present continuous, or you can put it in a way that it's also what the present tense. So it depends on the style of the journal. So remember I said you need a sample paper. Once you get the sample paper, then of course it can help you to look at what is the tense of the papers that have been published over time in that particular journal. And that is very important. And in fact, in clarity is one of the things that is very central in all types of a uh, journal or disciplines that we have. So when you present your data in a very precise language, it makes it very interesting. And then you have to avoid uh, grammatical errors. Eloquence is what you need. But luckily for us today, we have writing support system. We have Grammarly that is around. You can subscribe to Grammarly. However, you need to be very careful with Grammarly. Grammarly may not know your context of your writing. Technical jargons that are in your in your writing, it may not uh, the, 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 the AI uh, may not understand your technical jargon. So because of that, you may want to look at what the AI is suggesting to you to see whether it fits in your uh, 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 context before you accept the change. Then we also have a quillboard where you can uh, help with paraphrasing. But I must say that you need to also be on top of issues. 
or you even can contact out your after you have written you can give it out to an editor who will go through the work for you and edit and make it suitable for publication in neither they require you to send your work to a professor to edit your work for you and you present evidence that you have what gone for editing but if it is a research paper, you may not need that. But if it is a thesis, you need a qualified professor to read your work for you. That is different. But with your own paper that you want to publish, our advisor try to look for uh, editing services to help you to figure out or you look for your senior colleagues who are better in writing to help you to avoid the grammatical errors. The moment your work is full with uh, grammatical errors, it is going to be rejected at the next level. Even no matter how good or uh, 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 fit your paper is, it will be rejected. So for example, it will be better to use very simple sentences and to avoid uh, repetition don't repeat yourself if you want to make reference to a statement that has been made earlier you have to state that um in in maybe in page this paragraph this uh it i raised the point that a relates to b i get it but you don't have to repeat the same thing that you said in paragraph six or something and I, I, I have grown to love quantitative. I want to um, make references to tables rather than repeating myself. And that is one good thing you can uh, adapt as well. Okay, then condense, condensation, compress the written text. You have to compress the work. Don't, after your first draft, I usually have first draft, second draft, third draft, and fourth. Even my fifth draft, it's always, always a draft. Even the final work that I draft, the final draft, I will still have a what? Final, final draft. So it is something that you have to reduce your language and compress it so that at the end of the day, your write-up will avoid the repetitive text. So I used a, a, the find button. I typed this word to see whether I've repeated it several times in my work or not. And then from there, I can restructure the work again. Your use of nouns and verbs are very critical. So you have to be very careful. You use nouns and verbs that do not have double meaning. If you do that, then the work, people will read and interpret it the way they want to interpret your work and not what you want them to interpret it. So just be very uh, careful about that. And sometimes avoid wordy sentences. Um, sometimes sentences that are too bulky in the mouth, you are reading and it doesn't make sense. They are hanging, what, hanging statements that you are making. And so try to avoid hanging sentences. Instead, use tables and graphs and illustration and then to, to explain a complex uh, uh, situation or findings rather than using words to explain. And that will give you much better clarity. And the level of one is um, looking at analytical arguments. Sometimes you need to, dis your discussion section should not be substituted for mediocrity, rather show scholarship. Try to give a logical and a sequential argument. Let it move from one point to the other. Give very good information about the findings. Don't go outside what you did not find. If you do that, then of course the work, if your rev a reviewer take it, they may not understand you. So very analytical arguments need to be stated in the, the discussion section. And then the implications of your research. Here you need to provide a conclusion that is derived from the findings of the uh, results that you analyze. And the conclusions must be sound and valid. It should come from the work based on the work, based on the findings, what do you think of this? What do you think is going to help in terms of theory building? How is it going to help policy? How is it going to help practitioners in the field? And of course, what will be the future implications in terms of further research? So you need to look at that. So it is important that uh, your work 
can only be accepted in your journal of choice if it has a sound and a valid conclusion. If you fail to make it valid, then of course you cannot get your, um, your journal or your article to be published in your journal of choice. So make sure you provide a conclusion of choice that will sit well with the editor of that particular uh, journal and then they will send it out for review. N listen um, to this again. The fact that you send your paper to a journal doesn't mean automatically you get a review. It's sometimes rejected at the next level. So if you don't give the impression to the editor to believe that this particular paper needs a further view from another uh, expert, then of course you move from journal to journal and you'll be rejected at the next level. Avoid the next level, write a valid uh, argument in your discussion, give a valid uh, and sound conclusion, and that will give you the opportunity for your paper to be reviewed. And so the best way for you to look at your conclusion is to look at your objectives and then also your methodology that you use vis-a-vis -vis the findings as well. And so when you are able to figure out all these things, then you can be able to know the limitations of your study, then the conclusions and the implications that these limitations will have on the findings. Uh -huh. So that is how it's going to be like. Now, before you publish uh, or deciding on publishing, choose range and, spec and specialization. So first, is it right fit? I've already said that. Then you also um, look at the traditional journal vis-a-vis -vis the orthodox or the modern journals. There are some journals that are modern. They allow all kinds of uh, work to be sent to them. The traditional ones will only publish things that are extremely traditional. They don't want modern or deviation from what they already know, the conventional wisdom. So look for journals that are modern in nature, that accept other views or different methods of writing. That can be a better way to go. And when you are writing, after you have uh, chosen your journal that you want to go, try to look at the themes of or articles that have been published already. One that relates to your own uh, paper or topic. In that way, you can be able to look at the text analysis and look for particularly, maybe if the person have used a theory, look at how the person uses the theory in the work, and that can also help you to figure out your own. So choose the right journal by learning about their specialization and range. Check about their webs, I mean pages, uh, the number about us. So always go to about us or aims and scope and find out about their goals and mission. And then scan through maybe uh, if there are some journals that were previously in Scopus, but they have been taken out of Scopus. So if you don't detect these very important information, you may send your journal to a predatory journal that is not indexed in Scopus, and it will be a very serious. And some of the journals too, you go there and they are not indexed in Scopus, but they say that they are indexed in Scopus. So you need to be very careful. And you can sometimes contact the journal editors before submitting your paper. But it is not all journals that will tolerate this. So remember, it's not all journals that will allow you to contact them before uh, you send your paper. Now, um, general importance and citation. So the impact factor. So look for the impact factor as well. Uh, will it have the right effect? So your work, will it have a wider readership? Deciding where to submit your work. Mostly um, scope journals, you can look for their impact factors. And I would advise you as a newcomer or a new risk, a PAD person who is trying to penetrate the the, 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 the feel of academic writing. You may start with journals with a little bit a less impact and then move towards journals with what? Higher impact. Because sometimes the acceptance rate is just between 20% and you, you, you don't have the time to wait till you get to this 20% mark. 
So you may want to go to people, maybe quarter, uh, instead of publishing in quarter two journals, you can go for four, a Q, Q4, and that's okay. A Q4 journal for a start is not bad till you move upwards. And another way to check whether a journal importance or it is actually indexed in Scopus is to go to uh, www.cimago.com and type the name of the journal. If the journal is indexed in Scopus, it will be found in C CI Mago so that you don't publish your journal in predatory journal. And I will advise you, um, try to avoid journals that we pay, especially journals that are not indexing. So we pay for journal publication, but journals that are not indexed in Scopus, when you pay, there's, most of them are predatory journals. They are not good journals. And ship your work to fit the journal. So after you have gotten the range and specialization, now shape your work to fit in terms of the abstract writing. Some will require 120, some will say 250, some will demand, especially emerald journals like this, they will demand you have introduction, uh, purpose, and all that. So you shape the work to fit the journal. And so after you have done that, then of course it will be easy for you to uh, be able to progress in terms of your scholarship, and that will make your work compatible with the journal itself. Once you do that, then you are introducing your work to the editor. And once you see that your work fits the, the way you've arranged the work, is the same thing they require you to do. Then, of course, it becomes easier and it, it will help the editor to send your work out for a uh, review. And it is important that you pay attention uh, to very highly respected influential journals. These journals, you need to be able to convince the editors that your work deserve them to consider it. Because you may not, if you follow the format that we have gone to so far, and you come out with a very good paper, you can get published in a, a first quarter journal like Public Administration Review, Administrative Science Quarterly, you can easily publish in them. So it is also important to, it is also important to know that you can publish in any type of journal, um, but writing, publishing in Scopus journal is more valuable than even if you have thousand papers in journals that are third rated. That's one thing you should know. If one journal that you publish in the first quarter paper is on your CV, it's more better than three of them that are in substandard papers. So in conclusion, it is important to start considering scope of journal with less impact, as I've said, and then you progress to higher ones. It is also necessary that you, you seek for editing services and to polish the language and the sentence structure before sending your draft manuscripts. And before you even send your work to be published in a scope of journal, uh, you need to look at the journal websites for possible topics. So this one, we don't usually do it, but if you want your paper to be accepted, you must always check at the journal website for possible topics that they are interested, especially the call for proposals. There's always a place where they call for proposals on topics that they, they may be interested in the following year. So you also want to look at the publishing frequency, how long, uh, how many times do they publish in a year and what are the deadlines so that you can meet them and that would be very good. So um, I thank you very much for the audience giving me and I hope that uh, what I've given you, it will make sense for you. You can learn something from it and also to be able to shape your research ideas and at the same time, you'll be able to get your paper published in order to prepare you for graduation. So I thank you very much, Professor, for giving me this very wonderful opportunity. I have always been a lucky one 
And to have you as my supervisor was one of the icing on the cake. And I think I owe my career to you because you shaped my thinking in a way that I didn't know that I could go that way. And for that, I'm always grateful for your help. And I'll tell you that it's not over yet. We are, I'm, we are, I'm still writing. I think uh, the, the thesis, there's two, about two papers. I'm still hoping that we can publish them and that will be a very uh, good thing. So thank you very much, Professor. And I want to take this opportunity to thank um, the CM Scholarship Secretariat because they, without them, we couldn't have be able to pay for our PhD studies. So we in the Ghana chapter alumni, we are very grateful for NIDA uh, CM uh, Scholarship for giving us this opportunity to do our PhD and to come out to impact lives. So we thank you very much. On behalf of my other colleagues, I want to say thank you, Nida, for making us uh, what we are today. All of us are doing so well, and uh, wherever we are, we are uh, lifting the flag of Nida very high. Thank you very much, Professor, and I'm done. Yes. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Serena, Dr. Yes. <laughs> the presentation was excellent and informative to uh, the audience. Before okay. we move to Q&A section, I would like to brief in short summary. Okay. Dr. Jelena Airbenet mm -hmm. highlights strategy for conducting research and public article in the Scopa Journal. Um, she said most Textbook represent a multi-state process in course of form formulating and clarifying a topic, reviewing the literature, designing the research, collecting data, analyzing data, and writing up. But she said in reality, a researcher will probably revisit each state more than once. They will need to reflect on the associate issue and refine their ideas. And then she also explains how to turning research idea to into research project be by begin with writing research objective and research question to theory that fit to the research writing the proposal uh, that includes of title background research question and objective method time time scale budget and reference. More, moreover, she introduced how to writing a research paper by write paper from the inside out, begin with uh, the all important recipes, the material and method, collect data and adapt the result, formulate the outline of a discussion, writing a working conclusion, go back and write the historical context, uh, write introduction and write the title and the abstract. She also talk about research approach that is close of quantitative method, correlative method, and mixed method. And she concludes with step two, publishing in Scopa Journal that to, to consider about length of paper, uh, guideline, uh, learning from sample paper, fitness between research method, theory, practice, and so on that best fit the journal to a clear explanation of methodology uh, and keep it clear but cut out at unnecessary detail. Justification, present the result, check sentence structure and tense, condensation or compressing the writing text, analyze the code argument and show implication of the research. And important thing is should the right journal that fit our work now it's time for Q and A section. Uh, wow! You've done so well. You you, you picked. Uh, I'm so happy. <laughs> Nina, the facts are the smartest, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, we have very smart students coming to Nida, and that's one good thing. Thank you very much for your summary. I like it. Yeah, and I think the first person uh raised their hand already. 
ุณจรุงเกียรติ The question from คุณจรุงเกียรติ please Thank you Carrie, for uh, your presentation over the course of your presentation really, you rightly highlighted the selling point um, i.e. it is our research question that determines the type of research uh, we would we choose to use i.e. quantitative qualitative or mixed method research and my question is if I go for a qualitative research project, for example, um, to what extent, though, am I supposed to substantiate um, my research based on the ground theory approach in terms of triangulation and or uh, saturation in order to enhance the possibility of my research paper being published in the Scopus journal? Thank you. OK, so um, yes. Your research questions will determine or objectives determines the method that you have to use. Now, in terms of whether deciding to use a theory or um, going with a grounded approach, it all depends on the objectives of the research. So, for example, if initially your, the idea was not to discover any new theory, then, of course, you would have had a theory before you proceeded to the field to collect the data. And so for your publication, you perhaps designed your work with your already theory that you have set hypothesis on. However, if grounded theories takes years to be able to come up with. So with that one, unless even theories that we call theory, it took after they published the work, it will be another phase of your research a, a, a publication that is where the grounded theory will come out. So it will be years later that you will use this same data to discover the patterns and develop a theory out of it. But in for immediate use of your research output, you may not necessarily come to what we call a grounded theory. You may publish part of your data, then years later you discovered that there were certain patterns that brought some novelty to your data and that can give you a theory. But for immediate purposes, it's not quite possible to decide on whether it is a grounded theory or not. So grounded theories are usually takes more than probably 10 years after your data was collected or even after you have done publications before you, you'll be able to have a grounded theory. But however, some journals will insist that you link your findings to a theory and they will need a theoretical framework section in the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your lightning information and uh, answer. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank mm. you. Who want mm. to ask a uh, next question? Do you have question to ask? Uh, okay. Oliver. Lusan Oliva. Yes. Uh, perhaps not, not, not to, to miss this opportunity. This is a, such a great opportunity from Ghana, really. So, um, uh, as enlightening as your question might have been, um, I'm still wondering as to whether or not, even in, over the course of my presentation, uh, over the course of my, let's say, submitting my um, paper to, uh, to a journal, for example, even if I haven't quite uh, achieved a theory as such, but would that be acceptable for uh, to a journal though uh, to to, have, to publish my paper if, if I'm in, in the process of developing one? If you are in the process of developing one and immediately you you can't have it in the paper, that's what it means. However, some journals will insist you have a theory. So you may want that is what fitness comes in. So look for journals that are, do not require too much of what theoretical uh, a requirement. There are journals that are uh, articles that have been published without theories. It is there. However, some particular journals will always insist that you have a theory. So for you trying to in the process of developing your theory, uh, perhaps maybe it may just be a working manual. So you want to uh, publish your working manual that is also acceptable. You can, some journals will accept you to uh, publish the manual, like the working manual, a work that is in the process of being developed further. You can always state that this work have another component where theory is being uh, developed out of that data. 
you can state it. And it's all about you. The, your, the decision whether to include your theory or to send your developing theory to a journal is a decision that you as a researcher have to make. It is not a requirement for the journal per se, but you as a, a, a researcher will decide whether do you think publishing and sending that manuscript of a, a theory that is still under construction will really be accepted or not. So it is a decision that you have to make as an individual. But at the same time, we must also know that some journals do have their requirement for you to include a theory before it can be accepted. But for qualitative journals like this, they do not require theories. That is one thing you have to be clear of. For quantitative journals, they insist on theory. Qualitative journals, they can publish your work without any theoretical review or theoretical uh, a theory in it. Thank you. Thank you. That, that helps the enlargement horizon. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, Oliver, you need to turn on your microphone. At the beginning, they cannot hear you. Is that your student, okay. Juliana? Yes, he says my student. Okay. Yeah, Oliver, yeah. you are. Uh, can I? Yes. Right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, Dr. Avani, thank you for this information. Uh, it is very educative. Um, it's relating to the theory. In the first part of the um, presentation, you said that um, um, normally um, you need to, um, there, is a, there is a misunderstanding that normally you get the theory, then you go to the field then um, you you confirm it with it. But in other way too, you can can go to the field, get the data and confirm with your theory. But the yes. question that I'm asking is, uh, what if you, you get the theory? Um, for instance, um, I'm working on an institutional capacity and climatic change policy response, and I'm using... And the understanding is that normally everyone acts in their own interest when um, there is the when uh, um, neglecting the greater good of the society. Now, um, in Ghana, that agriculture is predominant. We understand that um, people do their farm; they cut down trees without planting it, which is which affect the community in, in general. But when I go to the field and um, and this understanding is not what is on the field that people probably people cut down trees and they plant it not affecting the general goods i mean how how do we um um find this this dichotomy because if um the theory is saying this and you go to the field and there is a change i mean how do you go about um coming coming back to um, rectify that yes um for a theory of course, I don't know whether uh, this theory is used quantitatively or qualitatively. So depending on the methodology that you choose, that will determine whether you are going to confirm or to disprove the theory. So if it is a quantitative, we, we are looking at what a set of hypotheses. So if you come and test your hypothesis and uh, the null hypothesis is true, what we say is that you fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the, the assumptions of the theory does not fit in your data that you have. However, it doesn't really mean that the, the, the assumptions of the theories are not what true. Is that okay? So, but it is only unique in your sample that your data did not fit with what? The assumptions of the theory. So you have to make that clear. However, you as a researcher must tell us why is this why do you have that uh, result? Because many people have used the theory over time and they have come to the conclusion that mostly people are self-interested persons and they are likely to want uh, to pursue self-interest than the greater good. And that has been an established what, theory. It is a substantive theory for that matter. And so these in other contexts have been relevant to the theory. Why is it not relevant in your context? Explain that. And that would be a very important discussion in your discussion uh, section. So you have to tell us what are the probabilities? Why is it so? 
and it must be believable. Okay. You must make sure that you probably you can find another work that has also tested and they had a similar situation, and then you can make reference to that information. Okay. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. To want to ask questions mm -hmm. or uh -huh. we have about uh, five to ten minutes and then we have to adjourn the section. Anyone have question, please? I think no so. So I have so I have question. Okay. <laughs> if no one have question, then I have question. Okay. Um, I think this question is uh, from your opinion. Okay. okay. There are some people. Some people always saying that uh, when they writing the dissertation, right? They have to write the conceptual framework. So, um, I told my student that. Uh, well, in order to wait to get and collect all the data, it takes so long. Why don't you writing down the conceptual framework and publish it? Right, so that will be part of your complete degree. And many of them say that writing the conceptual framework paper and publish in the Scopus it hard to get published in the Scott Bus Journal. So I would like to ask your ideas, your opinion, your experience. Okay. Yes. That's good. Actually, um, I think what Professor is saying is the best approach to the T, uh, PAD uh, output. Because if you have to wait till you complete your PAD dissertation, and then you, you do the publication, you might spend about seven years just for a PhD. <laughs> and that is, <laughs> and that, that would have, you would have grown old before you have the, uh, uh, the, the PAD, and that would not be good enough. So I think the approach that Professor is saying, I, a lot of us who were international students, that is what we did. We decided that we have, uh, instead of waiting till the end of our project, we have to uh, publish uh, sections of our thesis before we actually come out with the output. So I actually uh, published my section uh, five um, of my thesis before I completed the thesis. So what did I do? I I did a content analysis of my objective uh, three. Okay, I did a content analysis of object. I think it was objective one. So I did a content analysis, tried to look for secondary data. So that is a conceptual information. So I use that as a basis for which I wrote that particular paper. And that is part of my section uh, uh, five of the thesis. So I published that data even before I went to the field to collect my empirical data for the data analysis. So it is doable. Sometimes you can just take one objective, look for a conceptual information or articles, review on it, and then publish it. So it, it's, it's, it's not difficult, but it, Someone. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Any more question? Hello? Rotana, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear Any me, question? right? But um, yes. Juliana, she's free, right? Yes, yes. I see. Oh, okay, coming. now yeah. you're back. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One network, so, one T. Okay. Right, yeah. right. I think that uh, any more question before we adjourn the yes? Yeah, please. Uh -huh. You I have to turn on your microphone. Kunkanya Pat. Oh. 
Okay. I don't have question, but I would like to say something. Uh, Dr. Bunanan, I think good for seminar. And um, uh, Dr. Abanesh, thank you so much for uh, your information. Well, uh, your information were important uh, for us. And I think uh, when you talk and when you give information for us, very clear. And thanks for opportunities. And today, you are, you are like an inspiration for me. Thank you so much. You love me, really. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you are look like a mentor for art. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yes. So we move to Kunrachana. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope everyone found this evening presentation so interesting and meaning, meaningful for, for us. Before we separate, I would like to ask everyone permission to turn on your camera and take a commemorative photo together uh, for this seminar. If, if you are able, please turn on your camera and... and uh, Kuntanapon will that, take a, uh -huh. right. My staff yes. will take picture. Are you with us, P? Yes. Yes. Thank you so okay. much. So you got us. Two, <laughs> one, two, three. Please. One, two, three. How about okay, we thanks. give us a, a little heart? Like little this? heart? Oh, little heart. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Kun Tanaporn. And thank, thank you, you so much. much. Dr. Julina A. Abani, special guest for today, and SSA Professor Dr. Bun Anand Pinay Sab, the Director of PSD in Public Administration Thai Program, and all of participants for spending time with us today. I hope to see, I hope to see you, Abani, in Thailand, <laughs> in Nida, next time. Yeah, welcome. Cool, okay. <laughs> yes, I hope uh -huh. that. Yes, I'll and, make it. Uh, yeah. Yes. And I, I hope to see everyone here in the next seminar too. Thank you and have a nice evening. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Okay, good night and, and good day to you. Whenever you come to Bangkok, tell us and we all will get together. Thank you. Thank I will, Professor. Thanks for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.